Welcome to Hashtag 52 Needs, and this week it's all about challenge. And I'm absolutely honored to have with me Della Duncan, who is a renegade economist. She is the host of the Upstream podcast, a right livelihood coach, an Atlantic Fellow of Social Econ and Economic Equity at the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics, a gross national happiness master trainer, and an alternative economics consultant. She's also a founding member, member of the Donut Economics California Coalition and a former faculty member of the Ecological Economics at Schumacher Institute, uh, College. And she recently joined Gaia Education and spreading all her inspiration throughout the world. Welcome, Della. Thank you so much. So um, we both coach people and we work with people in businesses, but you work with people specifically in the context of changing the world and taking, taking um, all the things that we take for granted in the economic um, context and maybe having a, having, having a look at them in a different way. So what do you talk to people about? Mm. Well, the, at the outset of the podcast, I think we say, um, you know, conversations that challenge traditional economic thinking. So yeah. bringing in that word challenge right away. So I would, I would say that there are some assumptions that underpin mainstream economic thought and practice. And I love to kind of question them, kind of unearth them, and just have some more thoughtful conversations about, are they helpful? Are they mm -hmm. true? And what are the shifts that we can make about those assumptions? that would lead to greater human and planetary flourishing. That's mm -hmm. the goal, a more yeah. healthy and vibrant ecosystems, people, planet, you know, all of that. So I just like to challenge and critique mainstream economic thinking to guide us there. Mm. Okay. And are this are there people and individuals interested in working with, with you or are there, I mean, like, let me put it this way. There are a lot of startups that want to do work differently, but are there also, you know, like um, top 500 companies that are working on, on changing the economic system? Because a lot of the the traditional model is profit before people, but it's changing. We're, we're starting to thankfully look at people before profit. Yes, I agree. And I'd say there's many people part of the movement. I would say there are, there are individuals, there's academics, there's community groups, policymakers, and there are some business leaders, absolutely. Um, so yeah, the change looks different for each of them, but particularly I, I do work with individuals as a right livelihood coach. So that's kind of working with an individual on what is their contribution. Yeah. Um, but I also work with organizations who wanna shift to something possibly more with horizontal governance, you know, more democracy in the workplace, more transparent, mm. but also I do work with uh, organizational and business structures as well. So uh, there are many different elements of the, of the change that is possible. Yeah. Okay. I did an interview um, some time ago about B Corps that, that I thought that was a, that's, that's really a, a gentle way of stepping into making changes. I think you are, you are actually, you go, I mean, I'm not calling you <laughs> radical, but you are, or you are a renegade. I mean, you really challenge people. You want, yeah. I mean, talking mm. about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and having a look at what works and what doesn't work. And you're not just doing that again in, an, in a small context. You are really shaking up the world. So you're absolutely right that I didn't mention this, but I do not usually work with any for-profit businesses. I'm explicitly post-growth, as we call it, or we could say post-profit, post-profit. And the idea behind this is I really do not mean to stigmatize any individuals who are in any for-profit businesses. In fact, my partner has a small business himself. So I totally respect um, folks who are entrepreneurial, who are uh, who have ideas and want to share them and think that there can absolutely be morals and ethics in businesses. What I have a, a question about is the profit motive. Mm. So the business structure um, really puts that profit motive first, even if it's a triple bottom line, meaning profit, people, and planet, or a benefit corporation, they, they do better um, and they acknowledge that people care about things other than profit, but the mechanism of the system is still that profit is the overarching goal it's what needs to be focused on. It's what needs to grow. It should grow forever. 
So I just like to ask folks different questions such as, you know, how do you measure success? You know, and if you measure mm-hmm. success by money growing in your bank every year, yeah. is that helpful or is that healthy? Because maybe there's an amount at which mm. you might find enoughness. You yeah. might find contentment. There may be an amount where you reach and then you want to grow in other ways. Mm. Like maybe you want la- less work or more rest or more time in nature or more time with your kids or more time with friends. So I think growing and pursuing the profit or the number for a business is unhelpful to the planet mm. and also unhealthy to the individual. And I think of that on the individual level, on the business level, and also on the global level. This, this measurement of gross domestic product, the total exchange of goods and services, if we look at that as the measurement of our success of our economies, then we are simply measuring that number and we're not measuring all the other riches and wealth yeah. that happen in a society. You know, so we're, we're leaving that out when we so focus on that number. Yeah. It's very unhealthy and very unhelpful for climate and, yeah. and climate change. Well, that's why you're a gross national happiness master trainer, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I mean, not everybody is out there to change the world and, and go into work and say, you know, like, I'm, I'm just going to radically change the whole economic system. But what, what can people do at work? Um, I mean, I work with, as a, as a leadership coach, I work with people all the time and I say, speak up. You know, there are a lot of people who just go with the flow and they turn themselves into pretzels. You know, they are overworked, they're exhausted, they're depressed. And they, as, as you said, they measure their success by money. And they, the only thing they want is to be promoted and earn more money. And I love working with people who say, you know what? The, the job I have is great. Um, I don't need to stretch myself into such in such a way that my family and my health suffers because I also want to have a life outside of work. I want to become a functional uh, or a more functional human being. But um, what do you, I mean, what do you challenge people or what, what kind of tips do you have for people who say, I want to challenge myself at work? So I would invite that person, let's imagine someone working in a for-profit business who's having these symptoms that you're talking about. I would, I would acknowledge and listen. And I would say, <clears throat> these are the systemic reasons for what you're feeling. Yeah. That capitalism, the for-profit motive, and the private ownership structure, like having a boss, these things lead to feelings of loneliness, of competition with your colleagues, of um, alienation from your work, meaning you're constantly doing work that is not valued in terms of how much money you're making. Um, And the productivity is kept, keep trying to be rationed up. So I would invite folks to first see how the system is, is, is creating the harm or the suffering that they're feeling. Mm. Um, I would then, if, if there's somebody who loves their business, they feel excited about their business. I would say, what if your business became a means to an end and not an end in itself? Meaning what if you became a hybrid, not for profit slash hybrid business? Meaning what if there was a pizza place, for example, everyone was paid a living wage. Everyone Um, had sustainable supply chains, you know, ethical cheese and dough and all that. Um, But at the end of the year, 100% of that profit was redirected to a nonprofit of their choice, Mm. a homeless shelter, a rape crisis center, um, a climate action coalition. So so all of their efforts in that for-profit business, they were making a living wage, they're being um, their needs are being met, but all of their work ultimately is going to serve this greater good, this social or environmental mission-driven organization. But I would also encourage folks to look at the decision-making structure. And I would say that there are so many ways that you can transform that decision-making structure to make it less hierarchical, mm-hmm. more democratic, more transparent, where your, vi- your voice can be heard. So yeah. sometimes that looks like going from a regular enterprise for-profit structure to a worker cooperative. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of groups that are helping people do this, especially older folks who are retiring. There's There's something called the silver tsunami where we're saying, what if all the older people who are retiring sold their businesses to their employees, thereby democratizing the wealth and the decision-making 
And we know that cooperatives are much more sustainable, much more ethical, and, and people who work within them have much higher levels of well-being. Mm. So that would be one way. But like I said, to go even further, the kind of the, the pushing it, the radicalness that you described, I would say transforming the business into a worker cooperative, but then transforming that worker cooperative into a hybrid not a uh, for-profit slash not-for-profit business structure where a hundred percent of the profit at the end of the year goes to a nonprofit or a mission-driven cause of their choice. Okay. All right. Well, that, that sounds like a, like a long-term really great plan. And I think in terms of, um, and, and I'm very happy if people say, no, it's, it's about money, you know, and I really need to make sure that I have enough money in the bank for, 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 you know, plan B, plan C, plan D, everybody has completely different needs. But again, it's about stepping outside of that and looking at the bigger picture. How does, how do we contribute with our thinking to the larger economy, to the larger world we live in and to the stress that people have? Again, as you said, you know, how we buy things, you know, do we buy things that are, that are, that are, that are um, fair trade or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but it's about again. It's it's for me. It's always the the ability to think critically, to look at the larger picture, and to say, is this really working for me? Is this really working for the world? And I think we need to have more of that critical thinking these days. And so this is when you say we're talking about cooperatives. It there's a requirement for people to think. You know, when everybody has to make a decision, you have to step up. You can't just sit there and say, oh, I'll just wait for somebody else to make a decision. And I think that's a lot of the times at the moment, people are in such overwhelm with everything that's going on, they'd rather leave the decision making up to other people. I, I would say that a close cousin to our need for challenge is our need for contribution. Yes, I, I truly believe that although some of us may feel that we have to scrape by and, and get our basic needs met because our economy does make us feel precarious, right? Yeah. Especially in countries where we don't have healthcare or education that's mm -hmm. universal, right? So I, I totally acknowledge the difficulty of that. And yet I still believe people all have a need for contribution in society. Yes. So I, I do think that our work can be a vehicle for that contribution. And I think everyone gets that. And one example of this in universal basic income studies, mm -hmm. a lot of people think, oh, if people were given a universal basic income, people would just sit back on the couch and watch Netflix and eat potato chips all day. <laughs> That's not what the research no. says. The research says sometimes people take a, a short break because they've been working and they're exhausted and they have burnout. But almost every single time, people then find something productive, meaningful, and beautiful, some way to contribute to society. Yeah. It may be art, it may be caring for people, it may be activism, it may be research, and it may be other productive labors as well. I mean, all of that is productive. So just to say, I think contribution is key to talk about as well as challenge in terms yeah. of needs. Absolutely. So there's, before we challenge ourselves, we get, we've got to challenge assumptions and the way we look at the world. I mean, when you say that older people contribute, I mean, ageism, for example, I, I, that's one thing that I, I, would, I would challenge because a lot of people who are older actually have much more to contribute. Mm. I mean, I find it really difficult to imagine that somebody is cut off in their mid 60s when they've just reached that level of wisdom where they can actually say, I've got all the experience. Now I can finally contribute because I don't have to just challenge myself, but I can challenge because I come from that from that sense of I trust myself so I can contribute. One of my favorite reframes is not you go into retirement, you go into refirement. <laughs> and like so that, that it can actually be a period of, yeah, lots of yeah. contribution and, and gift to the rest of the world for sure. Yeah. Okay. So how do we summarize this, what we've just talked about? How do we summarize this? I think, I think the insight that I had is that one of the ways that we can meet our need for challenge is by tapping into what is the contribution that I want my work to make? Mm. Like, where do I want to contribute? Maybe there, is there a cause you care about or an effort or something? And if you can bring it into your work, you know, if, if that's possible at all, beautiful. If you, if it doesn't make sense with your everyday job, then could it be some activism or systems change work that you also do? But I think that a, one way to meet our need for challenge is to tap into our need or 
her connection with contribution. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think we've actually said it in that way, but my, my, what I just got out of this was the need to stay solution focused, not just be the pe pebble in the shoe and, you know, saying, oh, nothing's working or I hate my work or, you know, I'm really stressed out, but looking at what you can actually do to challenge assumptions and again, contribute and, and doing it in such a way that it, that it creates a sense of fulfillment, which is what fulfilling needs is all about. So you can use challenge in a really, really constructive way. So that would be my summary. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just add going back that, um, you know, if somebody is feeling that stuckness or they're not feeling happy in their work, um, you know, to your point, there are things we can do in our own thinking, right, to, to be solution focused, to change our attitude or mindset. And then I was also inviting, you know, just that sense of like, what are the systems that I'm a part of? How are they contributing to my sense of, you know, discomfort or not feeling well in this work situation? Um, just because sometimes we change our mindset, but sometimes we need to change the structures, yeah. right? The systems. And so looking at that for-profit piece, looking at that ownership model, looking at that decision-making process, yeah. these can feel much more difficult, but I think those challenges are necessary for this larger change to a more equitable and sustainable future. Yeah. And they could lead to greater, per they would lead to greater personal well-being for you as well. Absolutely. So just, it's like a both and. Yeah. My, my experience as a, as a coach working in an organization has always been that people, when I start, when I challenge people on the assumptions that they've made about what is the right way of doing things and what are the conditions they have to accept because there is no choice. Whenever I say, go, go and start negotiating them and start questioning them, start talking to your leaders, not from a rebellious child kind of place where you go, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, but from a there's another option and let's think outside the box. And a lot of leaders actually welcome that when it doesn't come from, you know, it's not working, help me fix it, or you've got to fix it, but I've got some ideas. And a lot of things are totally negotiable because people, leaders really would like, I mean, at least the, the leaders that I love working with, totally welcome people's input and saying, let's just make this, do this differently. And especially in, in organizations where the boss is actually the one who can make those changes when there is not a board and, you know, shareholders, and all of that attached to it, it's much, much easier. But even then it's possible to make changes. So yeah, let's embrace challenge um, and move forward. And again, step outside the comfort zone and just keep moving. I think that's the key. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much, Della. That has, this has been hopefully a, I mean, for me, it has been a really thought provoking conversation and I hope it's been for everybody who's watching and um, thank you again. And I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Mm -hmm.